Our last speaker today is uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dale Pittman. Uh, Dale received his undergraduate degree from Hampton Sydney College, and um, like many of our spe other speakers, he graduated from Richmond School of Law. He currently maintains a statewide consumer protection litigation practice in Petersburg and is dedicated to, uh, to defending low-income residents of Virginia. He has contributed to numerous National Consumer Law Center publications, and he's been recognized as a leader in the community by organizations such as the Virginia Poverty Law Center. We are very honored to end this uh, program today with Dale. Please give him your attention. Thanks. Thank you. So is this I'm on? You can hear me okay. Good. Okay. Uh, let me just, we're going to talk about the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act today, the FDCPA. And what I'm going to do is in invite, first of all, questions. If anybody wants to ask a question while we're talking, just, uh, just raise your hand and, and chime in. I'm going to try to go through the statute pretty quickly, a broad high altitude overview, and then look at a number of letters that uh, have been sent by debt collectors and trying to trace the evolution of um, a particular section of the statute as it's been developed. Most of the cases here in uh, Virginia, most in the Eastern District of Virginia. So let me start by asking, who here has ever heard of the FDCPA before the day today? Okay, uh, who has ever brought a FDCPA case as a plaintiff? Okay, good. And who does collection work? Okay, now, the uh, next thing I want to say is that I've got an outline here. You've got to have an outline because you've got to get it in order to get it CLE. It's a decent outline. I think you've got it in Word, so it's searchable. But this is the Bible. Has anybody ever seen this? This is the National Consumer Law Center's Fair Debt Collection Practices Manual. One is uh, the text of the manual and the other is a appendices. Now, they have every thing that exists under the statute. They've got, uh, uh, they're now searchable, they're online as of a couple of months ago. It's really great. These are fabulous, fabulous books and whichever side of the fence you're on, you need to have them uh, to read them in your office. And I, I'll tell you, uh, you know, there are a lot of good book manufacturers out there, West and all these other companies. My view is that they, they're largely designed to make money, to get what they can get in print and sell books and make money. Now, these people make a little bit of money with these books, but they're designed to have every single thing in there. And I, I'll give you a quick example if I need to sell, uh, sell you on this. I had a case years ago under the Virginia Consumer Protection Act. We call that a UDAP statute, Unlawful Deceptive Acts and Practices. And I was suing a slumlord in Colonial Heights who I said had 22 different violations of the Consumer Protection Act in his lease. And I wanted the judge to give me a statutory damages award of 100 bucks for each one of those. That was kind of un charted, there were a few cases on it, I briefed it, the judge agreed. We had a case a couple of years later and I picked it up and said, okay, I need to update my brief. I wonder what's new. I went to the UDAP manual and lo and behold, in the footnote that applied to what I was looking for, there was my case. Uh, Anderson v. Upatier, um, uh, Colonial Heights General District Court. I mean, you would never find that in a publication anywhere else. So this is everything you want to know about the statute and you really ought to have it if you're going to do this on either the plaintiff's side or if you're going to defend uh, FDCPA cases or if you're going to do collections work. So that's that. So the context of the FDCPA is, is not the hospital against Mrs. Jones, but rather it is the account that Mrs. Jones is said to owe to the hospital and a question of whether or not the efforts of a third party debt collector, a newcomer to the relationship between Mrs. Jones and the hospital, 
um, is engaging in conduct that's found to violate the FDCPA. It's a liberal statute to be remedially construed in order to promote its, um, its uh, remedial purposes. It's self-enforcing through the private attorney general mechanism. It, I think most people are familiar with this. Uh, it's pretty much old news, but the um, idea is that a, a private lawyer acts as a private attorney general to enforce this important governmental purpose. When I was in law school, the, uh, right after I got out of law school, they added section 90, 1988 to the civil rights statutes. We're going to try to promote desegregation and open society. And so no, no lawyers pretty much in the South, no white lawyers, hardly any lawyers were even sympathetic to the civil rights statutes, much less competent on how to enforce them. So we encouraged lawyers to take those cases. And um, that idea has migrated to um, other, other areas of the law, including the FDCPA and most consumer protection statutes. Uh, the remedies under the statute are, uh, well, the, the first remedy is statutory damages. And you, of course, we're gonna talk about actual damages in, in just a second, but you don't have to prove actual harm to allege a violation that gives you what the statute calls additional damages. I call it statutory damages. Anywhere from a dollar to a thousand dollars. It's been a thousand dollars ever since the statute was enacted around 77. It hasn't gone up. So a judge or jury can decide if there's been a violation whether to grant statutory damages or not. And the purpose there is to uh, help facilitate the private attorney general theory so that lawyers will be encouraged to bring these cases and so that we can promote enforcement without having to pay for an expensive federal or state bureaucracy like we might have with meat inspection or something. And so you can have, I'll talk about attorney's fees more in a moment, but you could have attorney's fees that far exceeded the thousand bucks. I, in one of my early cases, I beat $350 out of a defendant and Judge Marriage awarded me, I think, $12,000, which was um, about 20 years ago, to do, to accomplish that. So you have, um, you have uh, statutory damages. The next thing you have is actual damages. And when we're talking about someone who's been harassed by a debt collector, frequently that is going to be emotional distress damages. And that is, under this federal statute, different from, uh, say, the, the state tort for intentional infliction of emotional distress. I don't know if anybody's ever looked at that, but that's a ridiculously hard, high bar tort to prove. You have to show that the conduct offended commonly, uh, uh, commonly accepted notions of decency, that the, uh, con uh, the harm to the uh, victim was severe. It's not like that under the statute. You can create, I have a little checklist. I mean, you, you person was afraid, um, a person uh, suffered weight gain, weight loss, they were, um, they were nervous, uh, they had fights with their children, the person in the cubicle next to them saw and heard how uh, fearful they were based on the conduct to which they had been subjected. So actual damages is an open, uh, a pretty much a wide open claim there. I, when people started litigating these cases, there was once an article uh, describing this as the new um, punitive damages. There's no cap on these damages, and so it can be a real, um, a real problem for a collector who has gone way off the reservation. There was a woman in um, Texas who, who got a call one day and said that she owed for her niece's um, trailer, uh, uh, tra mobile home uh, account, and if she didn't pay that day, she was going to um, be 
are locked up. And so she said, I don't have a niece. I don't know anything about this trailer. They said, we're going to lock you up. In so the woman goes to the sheriff. She's an older woman in Texas and turns herself in. Sheriff calls and says, you know, this is bullshit. She doesn't owe this money. And they kept, she ended up in the hospital and broke out in boils. And so she sued, and there was a, a, a Texas uh, $4 million verdict. And so there was, that was appealed, and the, the uh, Court of Appeals said, well, those, those festering sores were no doubt manifesting the turmoil within, and that stood. So um, actual damages is whatever it is determined uh, to be. The, um, so you have actual damages, statutory damages, your costs and attorney's fees are paid. So what I, um, I left legal aid at 47 years old with five children and went into a practice where nobody was paying me by the hour. And it sounds like a totally crazy thing to do, and it may have been. But we're here in Richmond. Most of my cases are in federal court. We have the rocket docket, the fastest federal court um, in America, so you have good uh, cash flow. We have excellent judges, um, and so that, that's how I get paid. I don't charge anybody anything if I'm doing plaintiff's side work. Um, I, just, I just filed the case. Um, you get your attorney's fees. Attorney's fees, may, maybe you all know about, does, who knows what the Johnson factors are? Okay, nobody knows what the Johnson factors are. Okay, so you get um, your attorney's fees if you win one of these cases, and attorney's fees are generally determined on the basis of what's called a lodestar. Your hours in the case times your hourly rate. That is the, the guiding light, is the, uh, what the courts say. You don't have to win on every claim. If you had uh, seven theories and you won on five of them, you're not, you're not going to suffer a loss of the time on the two that you didn't win as long as they're inextricably intertwined with the rest of the, the case. And so um, you can, as I said a minute ago, you can be awarded fees much higher than uh, the merits award. I've, I've had, you know, a thousand bucks for the consumer and 15,000 for the, um, uh, for, for me, for my fees, based on, on my time in the case. Um, there is a Fourth Circuit case, I don't know whether it's in the materials or not, but Randall versus H&P Capital, where we settled a case for 5,000. This uh, guy from Texas went and, and fought us tooth and nail, tooth and nail on our uh, time in the case, and the uh, judge Locke, who was then a magistrate judge, said, yeah, these guys are entitled to $82,000 because they documented their time. They were even generous and exercised billing con uh, uh, discretion and cut their request by 10%. They appealed that, uh, objected to Judge Payne. He agreed. He cut maybe 7000 off our fees. And the Fourth Circuit said, you know, these guys did a great job. They got $5,000. This woman was only entitled to um, 1000 They uh, they enforce the statute and they get their 70,000 bucks. So you get, that's how you get paid. You've of course got to sue somebody who can afford to pay you. Um, the defenses under the statute are limited. There is one uh, defense, we're gonna talk about theories in a minute, but I wanted to get remedies and defenses out of the way first. There is what's called the bona fide error defense. If a debt collector shows that their conduct was Un was not intentional and occurred despite having a, um, a reasonable procedure, uh, uh, occurred because of a bona fide error despite having reasonable procedures in place to avoid the occurrence of the particular error, then there's, there's no liability. I, for years, viewed that largely as a defense Lawyer Relief Act because it's hard to show that and debt collectors tend to trot out the um, bona fide error uh, defense. There was a question for years as to whether or not a mistake as to the legal requirements under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act was a bona fide error. There was a split in the circuits. The 
Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court in a case called German, J-E-R-M-A-N, it's probably in my materials, said that is not a, a bona fide error defense. They didn't say whether a mistake as to a matter of state law was a bona fide error or not. But so the defenses are pretty constricted. The standard for gauging deception, we're going to talk about deception in a few minutes, is the least sophisticated consumer standard. The, uh, the letter that you write or the thing that you say on the telephone to a consumer that gets you called on the carpet by someone like me is gauged by the least sophisticated consumer standard. And that's the lowest, pretty much the lowest person on the sophistication ladder. The courts say that's not, it, it, a letter is not gauged or, or a threat is not gauged by how a Philadelphia lawyer or a federal judge would interpret it by how some very unsophisticated person would interpret it. And we'll look at that as we go through the letters. It, it does not mean that a bizarre or idiosyncratic interpretation of a statement or a threat uh, is going to prevail, so you can't become but so clever in taking these cases. Um, the, uh, <coughs> The transactions that are covered are consumer credit transactions. So this will not, this statute will not allow you to bring a case um, involving debt collection for a business debt. Let's say a person has a pickup truck that they haul the emulsion for their yard cleaning work. If, if you threaten, if they're threatened on that, that's a business debt and it's not covered by the FDCPA. Uh, the Debts that are covered are debts that are incurred primarily for personal, family, or household use. Credit card, you know, credit cards, uh, car loans, hospital bills. There is no exception to liability for fraud on the part of the consumer. And that's pretty clear. So if that came up first in the area of bad check cases, uh, someone wrote a bad check, and then there was a debt collection harassment to try to collect it. There was a, uh, a case, Keel v. Wexler, in the Seventh Circuit, where uh, Wexler, who was sued all the time for his collection activity, said, this person, judge, um, wrote a bad check. They engaged in fraud. They're not entitled to protection of the statute, and they're not uh, satisfactory as a class member. Um, and the court said that's not the... Uh, that's not, you're looking at the shenanigans of the debt collector and not whether the consumer had clean hands or something like that. We've had, I think probably every judge in Richmond has said the same thing. I know Judge Payne has said that, Judge Smith in, um, in Norfolk has said that. I, I, when I just said class actions, I just wanted, I realized that I didn't mention the remedies for a class action. If you write a bad letter, we're gonna look at these letters in a minute, you send the same letter to a thousand people, that's something that's uh, readily susceptible to class relief. The, um, when you look at a, bringing a class action under the statute, I have to tell you that the remedy is mathematically quantified and it is the lesser of 1% of net worth or $500,000. So, you know, the only time I've ever had anything go to 500000 that's when you've got a, a $50 million net worth. I mean, I think we sued Dun & Bradstreet once, and they said, yeah, you're right, we, you could get 500000 But typically, there's a fight in class actions over that because given the rule, all debt collectors try to show a low or negative net worth, and then there's a fight over what the book, whether the books are right or not. Um, the validity of the underlying debt is immaterial. You can fall behind in your payments, lose a job, and uh, then be the victim of debt collection harassment, and there's, it's immaterial that you actually owe the debt. Uh, the, the act only covers uh, debt collectors. It does cover lawyers. There's, there's just no question about that anymore. The statute's clear, the cases are clear. 
A debt collector is someone who regularly um, collects debt or has as the principal purpose of its business the collection of debt. So now, I don't co do collection work. And so if I um, did a collection case for a neighbor, you know, once in 10 years, which I, I is, has happened, uh, I'm not covered by the statute. I mean, I could go and break the person's kneecaps. I would break some law, but I wouldn't be violating the FDCPA. Um, so I'm going to talk quickly about communications. Communications uh, uh, are, um, uh, are strictly, um, in for, uh, strictly pro they're, they're strictly regulated, I'm sorry. Uh, if you know that a consumer is represented by an attorney with respect to a debt, you can't contact the consumer. You can't contact the consumer at unusual times or places. You can't call a person. The presumption is before 8 o'clock in the morning or after 9 o'clock at night. If someone works graveyard and they tell you that, then you can't call them in the middle of the day while they're asleep. You can't call someone at their place of employment if you know that uh, the employer prohibits that kind of communication. Then another thing that's really powerful is that you can, uh, you can tell, a, uh, you can write a debt collector and say, don't contact me anymore, cease communication, I ref or you can say I refuse to pay the debt and they have to stop. And that, that frequently just doesn't happen. They keep, um, they keep contacting the consumer. So if you're thinking about doing consumer cases or this kind of case, what I'd recommend to you is that you have the client, the consumer, write a cease communication letter or write a, partic uh, you know, a clear, valid dispute as to why they don't owe the debt. Don't write it yourself because if you do, the two things are going to happen. One is they're going to start calling you all the time, and you don't want that. I mean, that's just an intrusion. And the other thing is that if, if, um, if you write the letter, someone may say that you're a witness and you can't represent the consumer because a lawyer can't be a witness in his or her own case. Yeah. Could be either way, yeah. Pardon me? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I do. Uh, I'll tell people what to do. I may have someone go into my um, conference room and sit down and write the letter, but what you, what you always have to do is make sure the letter is sent certified mail, return receipt requested. And the way we do the letter, if we're going to write a letter for a, cl a client, we'll put the return address at the top then uh, certified mail return receipt requested and have a line and put the receipt number on there because if you don't do that, I promise you every single time the debt collector's gonna lie and say they never received the letter. So you have to, you do it that way and you get the green card. Don't wait for three years from now for the client to say they can't find the green card from the post office, okay? Now, I have a, I have a friend in, um, Who's got more chutzpah than I do up in uh, Grand Rapids? And he would have the client. He would have the client write the letter, and then they would take the letter and spill some coffee on it, and and run the chair in the office over it, so it really didn't look like a lawyer had anything to do with it. I, I don't, I don't like that. But the idea is, I'm, I don't. My the letter that we help a consumer write is not going to have any um, any wherefores or two wits or in view of the foregoing in there. It's going to be a letter saying, I don't owe this debt. This debt was paid um, 10 years ago. You're, you're, you can't sue me now because we're out of stat and go away. And so you, you write those letters and then uh, save it, get it up in the cloud, and later that person's going to call you back and say, I've heard from them again, uh, particularly with the larger collectors. Um, I have a client right now who was ha, wha, has a very common name and he has got perfect credit. He's, he's in his field. He's a professionally recognized person who's been quoted on the front page of the New York Times before. 
he continued to be sued because uh, he continued to be harassed because his name was a common name and it had been confused with someone else who had been to a hospital in the area. We filed a case on his behalf almost 10 years ago. That case was dismissed for reasons unrelated to what I'm saying. We brought another case. Um, that case has settled with groundbreaking changes across the country in the way certain collection and reporting is done. Nine and a half million dollars in fees to the plaintiffs. It's in the Fourth Circuit. They just called him again last week. I mean, you know, it just, it's, uh, it happens. And um, uh, so there can be no third party contacts. We're gonna talk in a few minutes about a, a case where uh, a third party was called. You can't call a neighbor. Um, and say, I'm calling for Mr. Jones, I know he's next door, this is about a very important matter. That alone is a violation of the statute. There's an older Western District of North Carolina um, case on that. So then the, the, uh, there are three, in addition to communications, there are three central uh, substantive provisions of the statute that prevent all abusive, false, and unfair um, practices. Each one of these has list of examples that are non-exhaustive lists under them. And by the way, I've given you the statute. I mean, it is this short. You, you should just keep it, look at it when you're waiting in court and, and you'll see uh, these things I'm talking. I just want you to get kind of an idea of what's out there so you'll recognize issues when something comes in. Under abuse, uh, you, you can't engage in conduct, the natural consequence of which would be to harass, oppress, or abuse any person. Frequently, it's um, con constant telephone calls. And that's even better when it's calls to uh, someone who doesn't owe the debt. I had a case, a friend who had a case in California a number of years ago where he had a recent Russian immigrant who had come to America had started life as a hairstylist and was making good living, a good citizen. The name was confused with someone else. She, she, the person got called, the allegation was 570 times. And so they brought a lawsuit and the defense was, we really only called him 130 times. <laughs> and, and so it was, it, was, it was, I don't know, half a million dollars, a decent, respectable uh, verdict. So constant calls, um, are an area where you might, you might see a case. The court's beginning to say it's gotta be more than 10 or 20 calls. So you need a case if you're gonna bring the case uh, with a lot of calls. I'd also digress briefly to say if, if you have clients who are having calls to their cell phone, there is the TCPA, the Telephone Communications Protection Act. This has become a really hot area because the F FTC has said you can't make auto-dialed calls to a cell phone to collect the debt. So that happens all the time. I, when I, one of the first things I do when I get up in the morning was I open up and read Law 360 and have a consumer protection or class action report. Almost every day there's a new ruling on the TCPA. And so here's the deal, there's a three year statute there I should say before I forget, there's a one year statute, a really short statute on the FDCPA. So if you think you've got one of these cases, mark it because one year goes really quickly. But under the TCPA, they may call you 400 times. And the, the remedy is either, the, the is, is between $500 a call or $1,500 a call, depending upon how well you show that it was willful. So th those are extremely, uh, attractive uh, cases that can provide a real good remedy for someone who's getting a lot of calls. You can't engage in um, <coughs> profanity when you're uh, trying to collect the debt if you're talking to someone. The case on that that, that I like to cite just because it's pretty outrageous is the Horkey case, H-O-R-K-E-Y. It's, it's in the materials. It's the Seventh Circuit case from 2013. There was this collection agency in Chicago they kept calling this woman named Amanda Horky. And she said, you're calling me at work, I can't take calls at work. They kept calling anyway. 
it was extremely upsetting to her. She started crying a lot, so she wouldn't answer her phone. Somehow the debt collector got the, uh, the phone of the person in the cubicle next to her and said, um, said uh, tell, and, you know, the, call, the an person answered the phone and said, Amanda's not here, don't call back. And the person on the phone said, look, the, the Seventh Circuit reports it as tell Amanda to, to stop being such an expletive deleted, um, well, there were two expletives deleted, but, uh, and have her call back. And so the, um, my friend Dave Phillips brought this case in the district court, and the district court said, you were told not to call her at work, and then you engaged in profanity. And so um, I, I'm giving summary judgment. Believe it or not, they actually appealed that. And so the Seventh Circuit said, look, when you call somebody at work and they tell you they can't take the call, that means you're not to call them. And the second thing they said, when you call Amanda Horky at work and tell her to quit being such a fucking bitch, clearly you're not trying to give her helpful advice on how to improve her uh, telephone skills. And so I mean, there was some hilarious language like that by the Seventh Circuit. Threats, uh, use of threats or violence, there's a lot of that that goes on and sometimes those cases can be hard to, um, to address because the people who do it may be offshore. The CFPB and the FTC are getting better at locating those people, but I, there, there are a lot of de deceptive folks out there. I had people who were sending letters and making outrageous threats, and the letters were coming from, well, on a letterhead from Jericho, New York. So I said, yeah, who is this? And I went to Google Earth, and it turned out that the address in Jericho, New York, that was on the letterhead was the, um, public library, and so this was just a, a complete fiction that they were there. So I call the number, I get a, an enormous uh, collection floor den with people with extremely strong non-English uh, speaking accents. And so I say, look, you, um, you told this woman, my client, uh, I'm her lawyer, that you're going to come and rough her up today at three o'clock if she doesn't pay. And they can say, yeah, that's right. And if, if she doesn't pay, we're going to come there to your office and <laughs> rough you up too. So that's, that's all a violation of the statute. It's, it's probably tough to, to, uh, to collect on that judgment. They would take a default, but y you can try. Deception is an area where there are just tons of cases. Anything that constitutes a deceptive false or misleading representation or means in an attempt to collect a debt. A big one is s threatening to sue or suing on time barred debts. This happens a lot and if you're not familiar with this I want to tell you that it as a, I guess you can get two minutes of ethics credit here. Suing on a time barred debt in state law in Virginia historically has uh, the, the result has been that it's 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 an affirmative defense that has to be pled by the defendant. But notwithstanding that fact, the courts have been extremely clear at the district court level and the court of appeals level that suing or threatening to sue on a time bar debt is a violation of this uh, rule against uh, deception. False threats of legal action, um, we're going to look at some letters that will give you examples of that are violations of the rules against deception. False threats of urgency. And there, there's a case where someone calls and leaves a message with a neighbor saying that the, the debtor's uh, sibling has been in an automobile accident. I mean, just outrageous. And th that had not happened. And so part of the violation was that it created a false sense of urgency to urge the person to call back. Um, the final area is unfairness, and unfairness would typically be attempting to collect a debt that's not owed, tacking lots of interest on that wasn't owed, or trying to collect a debt that's already been un uh, paid. That's considered an unfair practice. Um, I want to mention under unfairness, 1692F, a couple of ways to use that to skin the cat in areas that you wouldn't think of as being under the statute. One of those is repossessions. It, it, everybody probably has taken UCC and you know that Virginia is a, is a self-help repossession state. Some states you have to go 
to court and get a court order in order to, um, uh, to collect a debt, I mean to uh, repossess a car. But in Virginia, you can go out, I can go out and, and repossess Joel's car as long as I don't breach the peace. So if I go over to Joel and, and hold a gun up or uh, hit him in the head with a baseball bat, I have to stop and go to court um, uh, because I've breached the peace. But if I go to Joel's house and he says, Mr. Pittman, it's good to see you. I'm really excited about that lecture you're going to do. Um, I, I was just talking to your, my dad the other day about how much I enjoy seeing you. And by the way, sir, I respectfully object to the repossession. Well, if he, when he does that, I have to stop because he has, um, he has objected and withdrawn his consent. So under the FDCPA, you can sue that repo person for uh, the unfair practice of taking or threatening to take non-judicial action to, uh, let me read it. And I bring these all the time, and I like these cases, and I'll tell you why in a second, but let me just read the actual text of the statute. Um, Taking or threatening to take any non-judicial action to affect disposition or disablement of property if there is no present right of possession to the property claimed as collateral through an enforceable security interest. So if I go and break into Joel's garage to take that uh, car, there are plenty UCC cases in state law that say that's a breach of the peace. So when I do that, I have violated the FDCPA. Now, the, to me, that's far better than, than uh, suing in state court because our federal judge, I mean, we've got wonderful state judges in Virginia and a great state court system, but in the federal system, they've had a ton of these cases. They understand the case law. They understand fee shifting and I'm going to get paid on those cases. And you're also going to have a negligence claim that you can bring in the pending federal court action against the creditor who told me to go and repossess Joel's car when he didn't owe anything on it. Um, the other is foreclosures. Uh, there are new rules that with FHA loans, you have to uh, have a face-to-face -face meeting with someone before you can do a foreclosure. And if those meetings don't happen, uh, you, you have a, uh, and then there's a foreclosure, you have a good, I think a good uh, claim, a good class claim. We've got several of them against the foreclosure mills who've done that. Um, so the next thing I want to do is try to look at some uh, letter violations to give you an idea of stuff that you really should look for. So there's a, a big deal in the statute is Section 1692G, which has the 30-day validation notice. Anybody know the 30-day validation notice? Okay, so when, because we have got a, it's not the hospital and Mrs. Jones, we've had a newcomer to the transaction, um, and it's a debt collector or a collection agency or someone, you know, we know that those, those folks sometimes can be uh, mean people. You have to, when in your first written communication with a consumer, you have to give them certain information. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but just get an idea of that you need to look back at this. You have to tell them the amount of the debt, the name of the creditor to whom the debt is owed, and a statement that unless the consumer within 30 days after receipt disputes the validity of the debt, uh, the debt will be assumed to be valid by the debt collector. Now that could be oral. I can call and say I paid the rent to the landlord. You can call them uh, and that's an actual case. That's an important Second Circuit case. The, the next thing is that there has to be a statement in this first letter that says that if the consumer notifies the debt collector in writing within the 30-day validation period that the debt or any portion of it is disputed, the debt collector will obtain verification of the debt or a, a copy of a judgment if there's been a judgment. So in order to trigger that protection, you have to dispute in writing. And if the debt collector doesn't tell you in that you can only trigger that by 
a writing, they violated the statute. We're going to see that in a minute. Now, <clears throat> you, can't, you can't put anything in this letter that contradicts or overshadows the validation notice. That's clear. That's the circuit court law in every circuit in the country. Um, <clears throat> the Fourth Circuit decided that in uh, around 90, uh, 91 or something. So I had a, a daughter born in 92, and we had, um, she was delivered at um, Henrico Doctors. We had perfectly fine insurance, insurance that paid everything. I got a letter from a, a law firm in Richmond that said, Dear Mr. Pittman, you owe Henrico Doctors $71. I, I didn't. They said, then they gave the 30-day validation notice, what I just read to you. The next sentence says, pay in 15 days or we're going to sue you. Now, that, that contradicts and overshadows the validation notice. That leaves me as the least sophisticated consumer confused as to what my rights are. Um, so that would have been an excellent case. I did not bring it. I wasn't, I just wasn't inclined to sue these lawyers at that time. Now, where is my pointer? We're going to try to look at some example cases to, uh, to see if we can um, look at the evolution of the statute in the, um, how do I do this? Joel, I need some help. Let's see. If I okay, well, I'm in the first one. I was trying to go to the top of that. Here we go. I am a Mac person and don't know how to use this sucker. I'm trying to get my thing. You can do that. Okay, so this, go to the very first letter. This letter, and, and by the way, you've got this in your materials, and I think on most of these, I put the a case site so you could read a case. And if you just did this on a Saturday when you had time to kill, you could get kind of an orientation of what's going on here. But so this, this um, letter from this outfit in Tulsa, not a lawyer, said that um, we have been retained. Uh, this says we have been retained, okay? Now, what, who gets retained in this world, right? Who? Lawyers. Lawyers, right. Okay, so this was a formal demand for payment within 15 days. If you haven't contacted our office within 15 days, we'll be uh, required to pursue all legal remedies available to our client. Okay, that sounds to the least sophisticated consumer like what? What's going to happen if you don't pay? You're going to sue you, right. Okay, Any, is there anything wrong with that picture? The uh, imperial company saying that we're going to sue you? Right, so UPL, right? Unauthorized practice of law. So, can, can you scroll down a little bit? Yeah, yeah sure. So the um, the rest of this letter gave a perfectly fine, as far as I can remember, validation notice. That's the 30-day validation notice sent to this guy um, who did not owe this cable uh, debt. So Judge Marriage said, "You've contradicted and overshadowed the um, the 30-day validation notice." And that's a violation of 16, 1692G, the 30-day validation notice requirement. He also said that it was a violation of 1692E, the prohibition against um, deception, because they can't sue. It, it would be a misdemeanor for them to engage, to sue um, him on someone else's debt under the UPL statutes in Virginia. So that's really a slam dunk. I mean, but maybe it wasn't a slam dunk when I brought that in 96. I, I don't know. Okay, can we jump to the next one? Um, okay, so this letter here is from, uh, is, is uh, okay, that's not, well, we'll take that one. Th this letter um, was sent over a $7.77 um, radiology bill, and the person who got that went to a collection lawyer friend of mine, and she was appalled at it, and so she referred the person to me. Her partner, by the way, was uh, later became Judge Postilnik. He's changed his first name from Bob to Judge. And, um, <laughs> and so um, 
they say, there, there's a, if you can scroll just a titch, Joel, they say that um, they give a perfectly okay 30-day validation notice, but they say an important matter demanding your immediate attention, a matter, you know, uh, has been reported to this office. You should contact this office not later than June 20th, 96. If you could, if Joel, you could go back up, we'll see that, um, that uh, this letter is dated uh, June 13. So you think about, um, in fact, there's the guy who decided this case right there. Um, if, you, um, if you think about a couple of days for mailing, you've just got a very few days. It, and he used this term that I used earlier, a false sense of urgency. There was nothing that was going to happen if you didn't pay this within the five or six days between your receipt of a June 13 letter and June 20. Um, and the letter says, to stop further action, pay your account in full to this office. So Judge Marriage said that um, they violated the 30-day validation notice disclosure requirements because they gave the disclosure, but they contradicted and overshadowed it up here and they um, engaged in false or deceptive conduct because they say to stop further action, pay your account in full to this office. Well, what did we say earlier? There, uh, Judge Marriage said there are many ways to stop action the, because of the remedies under the provisions under the statute. You can write that cease communication letter and, um, and so that's a false statement. And then it's, a, it's just a false sense of urgency to, um, to, to put that junk in there. If I were, if I were going to do collections work, I would write, Dear Ms. Jones, I represent so-and-so. They say you owe 30 bucks. Here's the 30-day um, the, uh, validation notice. Yours very truly, Dale Pittman, and stop, and then put it away for over 30 days. So can we go to the next one, Joel? Um, okay, so this, this is a letter here um, on a hospital bill. <coughs> It has a perfectly okay uh, validation notice. And it says here, your account has been placed for collection. Your unpaid bill must be paid in full to this office upon receipt of this notice. Okay, wh when is that? When is upon receipt of this notice, right? Right, yeah, it's, it's when you open it, right? You open it, okay. So, um, failure to pay in full when notified will be just cause to place this item on your credit record. Um, so I sued on that and a guy who's, this guy's actually a, a friend of mine now, but he, he, they took great umbrage. They said the American Collectors Association has approved this letter. You're just harassing us. You know, I was harassing this debt collector. So uh, the deposition testimony was that they got, this was oh, you know, a few years back, they got a tape drive from the hospital. So the debt collector receives a tape drive. As soon as the tape drive comes in, letters get printed and they're stuffed in an envelope and the letters go out. So then the question, well, what happens after that? Uh, nothing. Okay, well, when do you look at the, um, when do you look at the uh, account again? Well, maybe 60 days, something like that. So, all of this stuff about putting it on your credit record immediately was a false threat, as Judge Spencer found. And um, he said that combining a false statement with a threat of adverse action of having this go on your credit report is also is a, um, a deceptive uh, act. So. Um, that was found, I mean, to me, that's a no-brainer now. It was a bit of a fight then. Let's go to the next one here. Uh, this one I thought was tougher <coughs> uh, for a couple of reasons. So this guy, Joe Talbert in Danville, got a letter that gave a um, fine 30-day validation notice, and it said that you owe $92 and change for an MCI uh, long distance telephone bill. And because of this, 
federal tariff, you got to pay $125.49. And apparently that was all accurate. But if you pay just the amount within 10 days, we'll let you slide on the tariff. So I thought that was a close case, and we brought it anyway, and so we're in Danville, Virginia, and we're in, in uh, 97, and we're in front of Judge Jackson Kaiser, who I'll just tell you is a great judge, but what I was looking at then was we've got a kind of close marginal case in front of the guy who sat on a Fourth Circuit panel by designation and, and agreed with the ruling that Miranda doesn't apply in federal prosecutions. So this is, didn't sound like a flaming liberal. He decided that um, VMI could stay all male, thank you very much. That, of course, later was overturned by the U.S. Supremes. And so we thought, God damn, we're going to screw this whole thing up if we go to, and Judge Kaiser was wonderful. He is a fabulous judge. They, um, uh, a couple of short war stories, they, we had several other cases that were brought around the country on similar theories, so they tried to MDL, multi-district litigation, and move us to Brooklyn. And so um, they gave us a polite heads up, we're sorry we're doing this to you. Well, what the, the MDL panel did, they said, the case that's furthest along on the docket with the most discoveries, the case in Danville, Virginia, and they did the lightest docket, so you're all going to Danville. Yeah. Uh, no, they are pregnant at that point, <laughs> right. <laughs> No, no, it's, oh, okay. it's the, the, it's, it's, and the, the $1,000 is there to encourage lawyers to bring them, but there's the, the actual damages. That's what I was describing with the case in Texas and the case in California. The, the, um, the, just the, uh, the emotional distress, the fear, the anxiety. Um, I gave this talk in Petersburg once, and I just said one of the elements could be loss of consortium. My lawyer asked me what that meant. I didn't. Um, <laughs> And, and so any of those things, uh, I had a, a woman who had irritable bowel syndrome, and she had it uh, pretty much under control. And so she started getting letters on a debt she didn't know, and the irritable bowel syndrome got much worse. And so you, it's just what someone thinks the value of the cases, but you get your actual damages. Now you can, the cases that I had, like the, the, um, the earlier one, we only took that as a statutory damages case, and there was there was not even a claim for actual damages in that case. And uh-huh. Well, but, but that's not typically the offer. Oh, there are a couple of things. One is people just say, look, Mr. Pim, if you would just make this stop, I'd be happy. Okay, and so um, this case here, uh, I'll finish the story and then I'll add more to that. Um, Judge Kaiser said that all this stuff at the top looks like legal gibberish to me. I mean, how is someone, how is a least sophisticated consumer supposed to understand that? So uh, Joe Talbot got, um, brought that as a class, and everybody who got that letter got some money in the mail, and he got a thousand bucks probably, and maybe and five thousand dollars for serving as a class representative. So if we can go to the next letter, I uh, don't want to keep you people late on a Friday. Keep going, Joel. Just keep on going. Whoop. Okay. Okay. So this is a more recent case. 
And if I earlier mentioned, um, this won't mean anything to you, but this is a 1692 G3 case. No, a G4 case. They say in this letter that um, if you notify this court within 30 days from receiving this notice, this office will obtain verification of the debt uh, um, of the debt or obtain a copy of the judgment. Okay, says if you notify, it doesn't say in writing, and you cannot, you don't trigger that right to get written verification or to get a copy of the judgment unless you do it in writing. And so um, they said, oh, well, we, we, you know, we verify to everybody. And this was Judge Hudson. So I'm, I'm trying to, when I mentioned the judges by name, Judge uh, Marriage, of course, was known as a liberal. Judge Kaiser is a social conservative. Judge Hudson, a wonderful, fabulous judge, is Justice Scalia's bird hunting buddy, okay? He, he wrote a wonderful opinion on this. He said, you know, they say they would do that, but you've got to comply with the statute. And he said this is a, a 1692G claim for not writing the validation notice correctly, and it's, an, it's a deception claim because they're, uh, they're not uh, reciting the statute as it should. So leaving out that writing requirement there happens a lot. And ever s this case was, the guy's name was Bicking. Ever since this case, we bring Bicking cases in Richmond and we cite Judge Hudson and we win. So can we go to another letter? I've got maybe two or three more letters and I'm gonna get y'all out here. This was not, um, this was a Third Circuit case a friend of mine brought and the point here I wanted to mention is they say um, if you fail to cooperate on this debt you owe, it could result in your being sued. And so my friend in uh, Kerry Flitter uh, said, they, they don't, they're not going to sue this person. This is just nonsense. And the Third Circuit said, you're right. And the, the, the debt collector said, well, we said we may sue. We, we didn't say we were going to. But to the least sophisticated consumer, that was a threat of a lawsuit. And that violated the statute, both G and E. Let's go to the next letter. This letter simply, there's nowhere in the notice does it say that you can notify us orally and we can't assume the debt is valid. That's a little technical, but we, that, that's, it's just they left that out and that's a good claim. There's no ruling on that, but that was settled. Um, can we go to the next one? I'm sure what? You would think, <laughs> you would think. In fact, it's interesting, um, let's keep going. We're Keep going. I, I had, when you look at this, I added some stuff to make it easier just to follow the theory um, if you want to read it later. Uh, this wasn't included in materials, but you can email me and Oh, I thought you had it. Sure. I'm going to leave a bunch of cards up here and you can, you can, I can email it to you and I'd be happy if you ever want to talk about a case. The easiest thing to do is just send me an email s telling me what you've got on your mind and send me the documents and then call me in two days if I didn't respond. Let's keep going. Um, oh, let's see where it took us. Okay, well, this is an example of a case where they didn't um, identify the uh, creditor to whom the debt is owed. They said the original creditor was Chase Visa, and they didn't uh, fulfill their 1692 GA2 requirement to identify the name of the creditor to whom the debt is owed. So let's keep going. Uh, we'll just skip that one. Keep going. Okay, so you have to state the amount of the debt, right? So they say your total debt is $202,000, uh, two, $202,197.64. Then they say this amount includes your outstanding unpaid principal balance interest, fees, and some other stuff. Those numbers don't add up to the first number. <laughs> judge Gibney, our newest, well, our almost newest uh, federal district court judge in Richmond said, the court doesn't even know what the amount of the debt is. And so um, that 
that case was certified as a class and Judge Gibney's opinion is, is there if you want to read it. Let's see what else we got. Okay, I'm one minute over time. Anybody who wants to walk out is absolutely welcome to do so. Um, this one says, all portions of this claim shall be assumed valid unless disputed in writing. Well, that's what I said earlier. You can just call the landlord, I mean, no, call the debt collector and say, I paid the landlord, I don't owe that. You don't have to do that in writing to overcome the assumption of validity. And that is a Fourth Circuit case. So that is the answer. Everything in Virginia, you know, you look up and there's God, there's the Fourth Circuit and you have to stop at that point. So you win. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this case here, a recent case, Rosenberg is another collection mill, I mean foreclosure mill. They, go, go up a little bit, Joel. They say that if you dispute the debt, um, unless you notify us that, uh, you notify us within 30 days, the amount of the debt will be, will be assumed as valid. It's supposed to say will be assumed valid by the debt collector. Judge Payne in March of two years ago said, that doesn't tell you who's going to do the assuming. And he didn't make that up. There are other cases that say just the same thing. He said, does that mean that the debt collector is going to assume the creditor, a court, a credit bureau, who's going to do the assuming? So what, what you said about Sam White figuring this out, Judge Payne actually said in his opinion, he said, um, these folks, he didn't say these folks, but they've been doing this a long time. It's hard to believe that the mistake was inadvertent. And so uh, let's go on a little bit more and I think we're going to be through. Um, I don't have time to go through this. This letter violates the act. I was quoted in Lawyers Weekly saying six ways to Sunday. There are all of these things we've talked about are in that, um, in that uh, letter. And if you want to read it, um, they, they say that you've only got, if you want to ever dispute this debt, you have to do it within 30 days. Well, that's not true. You could get the letter and forget it. And then you could move to s try to stop the foreclosure later and you haven't lost any of your defenses by not disputing it. So this was a craftily uh, written letter um, by a debt collector to, to intimidate someone into paying um, a debt that they may or may not owe. Okay, that was, that was quick, but I wanted to give you an idea that you should look at these letters and it, it gives you a way to help a person who may be in a jam. There may be uh, there may be false threats, all kinds of other stuff at bay. They may not, or they may owe the debt, but if the letter is screwed up, you, you've really got them by the short hairs and you can change the discussion for the consumer. Okay, that's it. <laughs>